Welcome back. Last time we concluded our discussion of Tesselwa, and now we're ready to revisit the sciences that flow from the dimension of Iman, namely Islamic theology and philosophy. Now let's first of all discuss the concept of theology in Islam. What do we mean by theology? The word that's usually translated into English as theology is the Arabic word kalam. This translation is very problematic, and I want to clarify why before turning to anything else. The word kalam in Arabic, of course, means word, and originally it meant the word of God, kalam Allah. That's one of the names of the Qur'an. According to Islamic scholars, the first person to have spoken of kalam in the sense of providing a rational defense for the word of God, Qur'an, was Ali. This is one among many fields of Islamic culture and thought which are said to have had its origin with him. And Ali's student, Hassan al-Basri, the great Sufi of Basra, was also one of the great patriarchs of Qalam. He was a very, very important figure who lived for 90 years. So you have Ali, Hassan al-Basri, and then the whole of the tradition of Qalam, which begins after that. Now, what's wrong with the translation of Kalam as theology? The problem is there's not a one-to-one -one correspondence between the term theology in English and the term Kalam in Arabic. The translation works partially. There's some correspondence, not no correspondence, but it's not one-to-one. -one. In the Islamic intellectual world, there are other disciplines which in the West would have been called theology. One is philosophy itself. Part of Islamic philosophy is theological in the Western understanding of the term. Then you have Islamic mysticism, Sufism, since there are certain forms of Sufi doctrine and exposition that would be called theological in the Western context. But in Arabic, these disciplines would never be called kalam. So theology in English has a much broader intellectual range than Kalam does in Arabic, you might say. Then what is the significance of Kalam? On one hand, Kalam is not as important in Islam as theology is in Christianity, by any means. On the other hand, it's important enough for us to be discussing it in this course, so it's not completely insignificant. I hope we can strike the right balance between these two extreme views. Kalam is important because it's defined as the science of defending the tenets of the faith rationally. Not interpreting those tenets, not reaching their inner meaning, not reaching the truth, but defending them. Therefore, Kalam has always been defined as being like the hiss, that is, the outer wall of a fort, if you can use the Christian image of religion being a fort, as it was used by Martin Luther. This was seen as the wall that protected, in a sense, the fort. It was not the inner life of the religion. It was what protected that inner life from attacks. And so you had to, you might say, respond all the time to rational challenges. Now, why didn't Kalem emerge earlier? In Islam, as in every religion, theology does not begin with the founder. Although the roots of Kalem are in the Quran, Kalem developed historically exactly like the case of theology in Christianity. Christ was not the first Christian theologian. Not even the apostles were. The first Christian theologians come after the apostolic age. Almost exactly the same happens in Islam. During the time of the prophet and the four caliphs, you have discussions which later become the foundation of Kalam, but they're not really Kalam itself. Kalam begins with the last of the caliphs, Ali, when he was the caliph in Kufa, when many important debates ensued about the community and the future of Islam, which forced him to give expositions on them and to try to explain certain tenets of the faith rationally to those who were asking questions, because an exposition or answer is always given in light of the questions posed. So the first Islamic century is really the beginning of Kalam. Questions emerged about who is saved, who goes to heaven, what is the relation between faith and works, what about free will versus predestination, and so forth and so on. 
And the answers to these questions have political consequences, as we'll see when we come to Islamic political philosophy at the end of the course. But the image I'd like to leave you with is that of a fort, with Islamic theology serving as the outer wall for a rational defense of the tenets of the faith, and Islamic philosophy or falsifa in its final stages of development, as well as mysticism or theoretical Sufism being the inward life of the city. That concludes our initial discussion of the relationship between kalam, falsifa, and doctrinal Sufism. In the next segment, we'll discuss the all-important debates between the two major schools of kalam, the Mu'tazilites and Asharites, on the understanding of the divine names and attributes and the created versus uncreated nature of the Qur'an.